punk generation had swelled the ranks of the free festival scene into a nomadic movement numbering in the tens of thousands, reaching its height at the Stonehenge Free Festival. It was total chaos. Uh, there were some very big, very heavy, very threatening people uh, moving around, Hills Angels hassling you if you took a photograph uh, of their motorbike without asking permission. A real feeling of lawlessness, um, an enormous presence of drugs uh, right in your face. I mean, everyone standing around with signs saying, here we sell OSD, uh, lines of cocaine, hot knives, all this kind of stuff going around. Uh, and just like unlike anything I'd ever seen in my life. And in the midst of all of this, everyone's waiting for Hawkwind. And uh, Hawkwind played uh, at about God, five in the morning, I should think. By the end of the 70s, what had been a fellowship was now under the control of one man. Calvert had gone, along with all the original members bar Dave Brock, who would lead from the front from now on. Inviting Hugh Lloyd Langton back on board as part of a new lineup, which briefly included legendary drummer Ginger Baker, who lasted an album and tour before getting sacked. And incredibly enough, Turner returned for a two-year stint in the early 80s. It wouldn't take a genius to see trouble ahead. Quite honestly, I needed the money. Um, I was in a band called Inner City Unit, which was breaking up because of drugs problems, you know, within the band. First worrying sign was, <laughs> it was he, he, he'd, he'd shaved his head. Oh my God! And he had—he looked like a unicorn. It did. He had a, a, a long, a long. <laughs> Horn, but, but then came his grand entrance in a, a stocking <laughs> suit, body, body stocking suit, you know, all painted in psychedelic colours uh, on roller skates. <laughs> It looked fantastic, you know, because I just sort of moved my legs around so that it didn't appear that I was moving my legs and I seemed to be just gliding around the stage playing my saxophone. <laughs> Absolutely no subtlety at all. Zaha! But it carried on like that for the whole flipping gig, you know, like honking away. <laughs> Didn't go down well. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think so, you so, might so. have done with the audience. <laughs> Eventually I came on stage being carried in a coffin um, by some of the road crew. I'd be put down and then I'd come out of the coffin in this outfit that was all UV and I just used to sort of whiz around the stage on roller skates looking like I was on ice. And it wasn't long before he whizzed straight off it again. We were going to have this meeting and I didn't bother to go to the meeting because I thought I didn't need to. And um, then I was phoned up to say, um, oh we had the meeting without you. And, and, you're, and we've sacked you from the band. And I thought, oh, thanks. <laughs> Over the next two decades, Brock led Hawkwind through alliances with metal, trance and rave, releasing studio albums alongside numerous live sets, and sustaining the band's legacy on the road with a core lineup revolving around Brock and the rhythm section of Richard Chadwick and Alan Davey that has remained stable to this day. But as the millennium approached, so did their 30th anniversary. And it was Doug Smith who suggested a one-off reunion gig. But reuniting the band with its past created inevitable discord. The idea had come from me to say, why don't we get everybody together for an anniversary gig and call it the orchestra? We did a survey. We asked all the fans to vote their favorite tracks they would like to hear the orchestra play. And then it ended up in a fight. <laughs> with the orchestra, well, I did that for the fans, really. I was involved with it for the fans. I mean, I'm the sort of person who, who do things if I can. If I can do it, I will. Yeah, that was a fucking screw-up, Susie. They got Dick Mick in from Morocco and Del in from Canada. And then they went on stage and their shit wasn't plugged in. <laughs> a wonderful example of Hawkwind, yeah. There were people who took their savings from their life. There were people who were in wheelchairs that came from America to see Nick and Dave back on stage together again. 
so important that those original members were there. It was all a bit very strange. It was nice to see some faces. I hadn't seen Dick Mc for ages or Lemmy. It was nice to see quite a lot of people. Or Dell. I hadn't seen Dell for years. And you've been with the band for a while, or you? Uh, no, I haven't been with the band for 26 years. <laughs> <laughs> How many years do you think? 26 since I played with the band. He doesn't look a day old. I don't. Dave was a bit strange. I, I couldn't shake his hand, I'm afraid. But we talked, you know, briefly. I mean, they brought on fucking Sam Fox to sing Master of the Universe. You know, I mean, that's, that's not only dumb, it's like a mockery of the song. And like, it's Nick's number. You know, it was always Nicky's number. You can't replace that guy. And he was on stage, you know. Orchestra ended in litigation over how the money was to be divided. And the schism between some ex-members and the current lineup turned into a full-scale court battle when Turner decided to put together his own group made up of former members. The band Ex Hawkwind was a band that, um, that I got together with all ex-members of Hawkwind. And I thought, well, Ex Hawkwind is a sort of an apt title, so I can't see anything wrong with that, because they're all ex-members of Hawkwind. But um, unbeknown to me, and unbeknown to most other people, David actually trademarked the name of Hawkwind. He put an injunction on me, claiming damages from me because of infringement of his trademark. So I ended up in court and um, having to pay damages.